probably never seen me because I'm always sitting in the corner. But today I'm giving a presentation about Lolita fashion as a form of play. And so once a week I meet with my friend Sarah here to just have tea and hang out. And we met through this fashion actually. But a lot of the times we just talk about, you know, the drama and news that happens in the Lolita communities. But a lot of times we end up into these really deep theoretical conversations about why we all wear Lolita. And so that's kind of what inspired me to do my project on this in particular. So I evaluated historical perspectives, theoretical approach, and personal motivations from my friends and the international community as to why we dress the way we do. So to start with, what exactly is Lolita fashion? It's often associated with the name of the 1955 novel by Vladimir Nabokov, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the novel at all. Unfortunately, this prompts a lot of outsiders who are unfamiliar with it to make assumptions about our sexual activities. So, but actually the name Lolita was a nickname from the Spanish, Spanish derivative of the name Dolores well before the actual publication of the novel. So the exact um, inception of Lolita fashion is kind of unclear, however we can trace it back to the 1970s in Japan where they kind of had a cultural revolution from when the post-war austerity after World War II started to fade and consumerism started to boom again in Japan's economy. So kawaii generally can be translated as cute. And so schoolgirls in the 1970s started writing with what's called ladies language, which is really curly letters, and they started writing left to right, like we do here in America. And so they started creating this demand for really cute feminine products. And so in the middle, I have a picture of Sanrio products from the 1970s, which I think everybody here might be familiar or has heard of Hello Kitty before. And on the left, I have a picture of Makoto Takahashi's artwork. He, his artwork is very influential to the kawaii revolution, as I like to call it, which is you know, characterized by really feminine, girly, big eyes, lots of flowers. And then on the right is uh, Rune Naito, and he did publications in the 1970s in magazines, and he was also one of the very influential you know, kawaii artists who kick-started this kind of cultural revolution. So the demand for cute goods also prompted the kawaii fashions to start in the late 1970s. And although my format is a little bit screwed up, the center image, all these are modern, modern dresses because it's nearly impossible to find dresses from the 1970s. However, the middle one is Milk. And Milk and Pink House were two of the forerunners for the kawaii fashion brands. And the three of the designers um, broke off to create Emily, Emily Temple Cute and Jane Marple. And as you can see, they're, they're pretty girly, feminine, maybe they reminisce you, uh, remind you of the 1950s. And they're really girly, and these aren't specifically Lolita fashions, because it, Lolita fashion, as it's known, to, as it's recognized today, didn't start until the third designer, um, Akinori Isobe, broke off and started Baby the Starshine Bright in 1988. So Baby the Stars Shine Bright is one of the most popular and well-known Lolita brands. It was even uh, it was even featured in the Kamikaze Girls film. I don't know if anybody has seen that, but it is a film that features that brand a lot. And one of their designers, Kumiko Urehara, was interviewed by Kawaii Patin, who does a lot of Japanese fashion videos on YouTube. And she basically talked about her inspirations and a little bit about the history when she first started designing for the brand. And so I listed a couple of inspirations that you know, the, the designers take for their clothes. And when she started, most of the designs were really simple and plain, you know, dual colored, black and white, red and white. And then eventually they started adding small details like embroidery. And now today they've incorporated elements from, as she says, girls' dreams. You know, lots of prints, really dressed up and elegant, definitely a change from the first images. I think these two images on the left were from 2001 and 2004. And the ones on the right are from this past year. So there's a huge difference between those. And Innocent World is another brand. This one started in 2008, so it's a newer brand. 
but they also have similar inspirations, and the designer and owner, Yumi Fujiwara, was also interviewed by Kawaii Patin to talk about her inspirations. And she talked a lot about her trips to Europe, and when I actually met her, I modeled for her in one of her fashion shows here at an anime convention in LA. And she talked to us about how she makes two trips to Europe um, each year, and she's inspired a lot by their architecture and their wallpapers, teddy bears, stuff like that. And the one I'm wearing on the right, actually, was the one from the fashion show, and that was inspired by uh, Catholic cathedrals in Europe that she visit visited. So that's one of her favorite things about this, is just creating things from European history. So the globalization of Lolita culture definitely spread with the growth of the internet. Before that, you know, people met on the streets in Harajuku on the weekends, and that's pretty much all the interaction that they could have with the world. However, with the internet, people can create social media and connect with each other across borders, create you know, wells of information and access to the brands in Japan. And now this photo is from the local community in San Francisco. Um, there's an international Lolita holiday, which appears twice a year, first Saturday of June and December. And so this was from our International Lolita Day meetup in 2013. And these are pretty much a good representation of the active members. However, on our Facebook group, we have over 500 members just in the Bay Area alone. So that is why that's why a lot of people were are attracted to it across you know across borders because of that you know mix of the Japanese kawaii aesthetic with a lot of European historical fashions and you know fashion elements. So I had to define play and by doing this I used a lot of the stuff from Stith, Bennett and Mahali's article that we all should have read. And so, to them, play balances every day's stress and boredom. And again, with my formatting. So, it, basically, that was supposed to say that it provides, it limits your choices while still providing variety. And so, Lolita Fashion does this by having both, you know, literal and theoretical rules to the fashion. The literal rules, you know, that guide the aesthetic, you know, petticoats, etc. And the theoretical rules of, you know, the players, the, the time limits. You know, we're not really participating in the lead of fashion when we're wearing jeans and a t-shirt. So, oh, and boredom. So it balances boredom by the fact that it is a fashion. It's constantly evolving. Brands are constantly releasing new prints and new trends are being introduced from Europe and Australia and Asia and even South America. So constantly new trends and new people. Old members are leaving and moving on with their lives and new members are constantly you know, joining the fashion and creating a really good cycle of new ideas. However, I had a problem with their article. I felt that they only focused on, you know, a certain type of playing and they completely ignored pretend play, which I think is important. You see it a lot in theaters, um, in cosplay, live action role playing, this Mardi Gras even is what I believe you mentioned. So, you know, pretend play is a projected representation. It's a little bit different from daydreaming because in your daydream you're creating stuff in your head. However, pretend play is getting that out into your world. And it enables people to create their own world and temporarily escape from their current everyday world. So the Lolitas aren't actively pretending. They're not saying, hey, I'm Princess Diana or I'm Marie Antoinette. However, it their fashion kind of symbolizes the fact that they've entered into you know, their own world for a time being. So, there are two main personal motivations that a lot of surveys and conversations I've personally had with Lolita's as to why they like this fashion. And the first one is that they're able to be their own heroines. They're able to look like dolls and princesses and fairies and queens and anything else you can possibly think of. You know, we associate them with innocence and simplicity and extravagance and, you know, dolls and princesses don't have to deal with, you know, taxes. They just sit there and, you know, look pretty. So I think that's one of the main appeals as to why we like this kind of look. We're able to feel like we just get to sit there and enjoy life and enjoy a beautiful life instead of having to deal with, you know, stress and boredom. And the second reason is that it fits our personalities. Um, a lot of people say that it fits their personalities, and while this is kind of vague, it makes sense. The people who are attracted to this 
don't want to leave behind their childhood. They don't want to have to give up you know, what, made, what made it fun to be a kid, all the simplicity and just having fun for the sake of having fun. So it's able to express your creativity and express your femininity without having to, you know, give up that sort of thing. So there's there's a big issue in academia on Luda fashion and kawaii fashions in general, is that there are different, you know, there's one general definition, however, there are different cultural issues that are often ignored. So academics usually just look to the West, it's very Eurocentric, and so they see Western Lolitas and they see our, what um, I interviewed, I interviewed a PhD student who's actually getting her degree in Kauai fashions in Australia, and what she says, she called it a visual manifestation of our dissatisfaction with society, and so academics just kind of look at that and they ignore where it started. They look at, they ignore, you know, Japanese Lolitas, and they don't really bother to go into their communities and ask them why they do what they do. And so the leaders in Japan, they want nothing to do with politics. They just want to be cute and be loved and just enjoy their own little escapist world. So that's really different than in the West. In the West, we've taken it and we've added our freedom to be individuals. We've, you know, we've incorporated our freedom from conformity into the fashion. And so we express our individualities through this fashion. This image is from a popular Lolita YouTuber it says peachy, and I picked this picture because it, this post that it went with, she talked a lot about how she needs to be a feminist because only little girls can still dress like this, which I think is really important because a lot of time on the streets, people kind of heckle us and call us mean things and assume we're either in a play or that we're somehow in this perverse childhood thing which I think is really gross, and the fact that we can't just be feminine while still being you know, adult women is an issue. So Megan Russell, the girl I interviewed, she says that academics fo focus way too much on the rebellion aspect of subcultures. Subcultures are generally described as a system of values, attitudes, behavior, and lifestyles of a social group that is distinct but related to dominant culture of society. And so that, that kind of describes a little bit of fashion. It's not incorrect. However, most writings in the media and in academic papers focus too much on rebellion, like you know, punks and the metal scene. And so it's really important to study and to pay attention to the more passive subcultures that are dominated by women instead of men. So pretty much that's the end of my presentation. In conclusion, this was my a really a synopsis of my thesis that we really wear our fashion to just you know escape everyday life to enter into our own world and just be cute and frilly and elegant without having we can just forget everyday's responsibilities for a little while interested in Ashlyn's paper and also last semester I had one by a student who does roller derby and one of the things that's becoming obvious to me and an, another one that influenced me was a girl who was talking about black hair fashions and in my generation of feminists we've been strongly dominated by an idea that we have to be like men in terms of power and in some ways in terms of presentation and what I see evolving here is a kind of new feminism that where young women are saying I'm not going to be bossed around by the older generation of feminists and I'm not going to be judged in terms of the male gaze and that's what she was sort of talking about in terms of people seeing them on the street and thinking they have a certain sexual agenda or they don't want to grow up or something like that. It's like they're not allowing them to have their own thing. So um, I, I actually think there's somewhere to go with this in terms of uh, the new feminism and I thought she did a great job of nailing the fact that um, Suzette Mihaly and Bennett didn't mention pretend. And so I think some of the other papers that we're going to hear today have to do with other ways of pretending and presenting, uh, which are, I think we're kind of seeing pieces of the puzzle come together, which is, is cool. You want to stand up too because we...
think there's a chance to see two sets of fa fashions here. here. So, so, yeah. this, so this is Sarah, and she actually is a loser <coughs> also. However, today I lent her one of my dresses <laughs> because I'm not wearing any 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 of the characteristic prints that depict stories today. I'm wearing just like a suit set from Baby the Star Shine Bright. And so this dress actually is called uh, Welcome to the Sweets Hexen House, I believe. And it's basically the story of Hansel and Gretel. So it's, yeah, a lot of, it's pretty unique to the fashion. I don't think you see it anywhere else where you see clothing with, you know, designs that depict, you know, childhood stories. Yes. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Yeah. Yes, so there's a huge <laughs> yes. discrepancy. You can either go the really cheap way with lots of handmade stuff, and I think an average outfit could, you know, cost what a normal everyday outfit, maybe a hundred dollars, what most people, all their stuff adds up to. However, I think, you know, our outfits today, which are relatively simple compared to what some people dress up as, it approximately, I don't know, that dress cost me $230. So it can get really expensive. That's not including shopping service fees or having things shipped from Japan or... You know, it sounds to me like a great argument for learning to sew, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> if I can, I just want to point out that a lot of people see it as like really childish, but I think ironically, anyone that really participates in this has to make a lot of money because these yeah. things are not cheap. So it's sort of like an ironic. Like, I'm actually an adult because I actually make money. So. Yeah, and the other thing I was I would thought you should look into in the future is what happens when you get too old to be cute. Um, <laughs> how, how do you top out of this world? That's actually going to take a long time because currently there's nobody old, old enough to have said, I'm not cute anymore. So I was really aware of this subculture from the Harajuku. Uh, there's areas of Tokyo where people have certain looks and there's times for them. There was one unfortunate look where a lot of Japanese girls were actually doing blackface. And, yeah, and um, uh, there's just, a, in Japan people really identify with peer groups and they really like to pretend. So this is, in Japan, this is what's like one subculture within a man, many and to be on the cutting edge of one of these was very important in terms of status. So I just think it's a, a, a really interesting, um, an interesting subject. Yeah. How often do you ever have to ask the other twins or like sisters for related? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. I think, I think you guys look up there. You guys totally look related. <laughs> it's just like white girls with the same hair. So yeah, yeah. like <laughs> automatically that could be Yeah. Actually, very frequently. Okay, who wants to go next and tell us about a another? Hmm. 